regular Pennzoil 5W30, Pennzoil high mileage 5W30, and Pennzoil full synthetic Dexos 1 5W30. Could there be a difference between these three oils of the same viscosity from the same manufacturer? Let's find out. And there are a few key differences here that actually tell a huge story. So stay tuned for all the details. Okay, so this is actually gonna be one of the most favorite videos we've done so far here on the Speed Diagnostics channel. You know, I was kind of interested to see what was really gonna happen from these three oils. Now, there are two things that came out of this that I really want to spend some time unpacking, but we'll cover those as we get through the details here. So let's start off with the regular old Pennzoil 5W30. As it says in the label, it's an API SP rated product. So we get into the analysis, we can see that it's 11 centistokes at 100 degrees C, which puts it toward the high side of the 30 grade range. That means that's good viscosity, good protection there, plenty of room to shear down. The oxidation value is 4.4. That lets us know it's a conventional mineral oil. It's not full synthetic ester blend or something like that. Remember that number is going to be really important later. And then we look at the silicon, the anifoam is right down there at 4 ppm. He said it's an API SP, which means it's formulated specifically for direct injection engines. It can pass all the ASTM low speed pre-ignition tests. That's one of the things that makes it an API SP. And we can see that in the calcium detergent package. It's a lower level of calcium compared to the old former API SM, SN packages that were in the 2000 to 3000 parts per million range on calcium. This is down at 1054. Now, I've seen a lot of people make comments about SP oils and the lower calcium levels not being as good. What they're referring to is the fact that these lower detergent formulations have a lower TBN, total base number. Well, here's the thing. TBN was made for the old diesel oils back when diesel fuels had high levels of sulfur. Today, we're at ultra low sulfur levels. So one, we're talking about a diesel package or diesel test in regards to a passenger car engine oil. And of course that was tested and done for years. But the problem is that TBN was designed to test the ability of the oil to neutralize acids in a high strong acid environment. With today's lower sulfur fuels, they don't create those big strong acids like the old fuels used to. As a result, TBN isn't a valid test to really tell you what's going on with your oil. I know that is heresy. I get it. Go ahead, kill the comment section below. But I'm telling you, not my opinion, both GM and Cummins disregard TBN anymore. Why? Because we don't have high sulfur fuels here in the United States. But I'm telling you, in North America, in places that have ultra low sulfur fuels, TBN is not a valid test to run on passenger car engine oils or diesel oils anymore. You want something that's gonna be able to detect those weak acids. Oxidation value is much more important. You can see the chemical degradation of the base oil which is the main constituent of the oil via oxidation and condemn the oil that way, which is why it's so important that you have your beginning oxidation value and you can look at it and watch that trend. That's a more important trend to follow than TBN. So go ahead and just forget about TBN. Don't worry about these API SP oils with a lower level of calcium, a lower level of magnesium and no sodium, that lower TBN, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean the oil isn't as good. In fact, our testing has shown, and we've shown it in the other videos, they actually provide better wear protection because that calcium competes against the anti-wear additives. So when you lower the calcium levels, you make your anti-wear package more effective. We've seen that 
in wear testing on engines so we know that it's true. So again, don't worry about these lower levels of calcium and magnesium, the lower TBN in these API SP oils. They're actually better than the previous generation. Just trust in it, go with it. Okay, sorry for that long rant. Back to the oil analysis. So the calcium is 1054, the magnesium is 291. So you got a total detergent package of less than 1500 PPM, which is typically what we see with these oils that are really good for protecting against low speed pre-ignition. Now we get into the anti-wear package. The phosphorus is 575, which keeps it right there in that window, 842 on the zinc. So anything that is in, they call it the ILSAC grades, which is, if it has a little starburst here on the front, like this one does, it's an ILSAC grade, which is basically 10W30 and lower, are restricted in the ZDP content. They can't have less than 600 ppm, but they can't have more than 800 ppm, and that's what we're seeing right here, but right in that range. And then the molybdenum, which is an anti-wear additive and a synergist with the ZDP, is at 118 parts per million and you've got 60 ppm of boron which could be there as a friction modifier or part of the dispersion package so that is the basic pennzoil 5w30 right there pretty much textbook what you would expect to see from a conventional api sp oil good stuff now question is high mileage what the heck makes this a high mileage oil is there something in here that's actually designed, engineered specifically for a higher mileage engine? On the label, it talks about having seal conditioners. Well, those seal conditioners are esters. I know that from my formulating experience in the past, that when we made, say, a hot rod oil, that we had seal conditioners in there. I know what additive that was. It's an ester. So the proof of that actually shows up right here on the oil analysis, just kind of like we would hope it would. We can look at that Pennzoil 5W30 high mileage, and guess what? The viscosity is almost identical to the previous one right there at 10.8, call it 11, same thing. But now we can see the impact of the ester, that seal conditioner, because the oxidation value has gone from 4.4 to 7.4. That little bit of increase is from the ester, which is the seal conditioner. We can look down the rest of the additive package, silicon, anifoam, right back at four, exactly the same. The calcium, 1100 parts per million, basically the exact same as the regular 5W30. Same thing with the magnesium, 307, right there at it. Phosphorus, 618, zinc, 829, molybdenum, 112, Boron 61, it's the exact same additive package, exact same base oil as the regular 5W30, but the seal conditioner has been added. That's what makes it a high mileage formula. Now, okay, so that's one of the things you can see right there. I told you there was two things, that, small little things that tell a bigger picture. There's the bigger picture right there. These high mileage oils do have seal conditioners to help protect the seals from you know shrinking and cracking that could cause leakage over time. Yeah, there's something there. You got a higher mileage vehicle, you want to protect it. You got something that has maybe has a leak and you're trying to slow that leak down. Hey, give it a try. You know that there's actually something in there. We can see it with your analysis. Now the next one, the platinum made from natural gas. So let's talk about that for a second. The made from natural gas is actually a process, uh, the GTL, gas to liquid process, is actually very similar to how we make PAOs, the poly alpha olefins, which are the group four base oils, the synthetics that have been around for decades and decades and decades. Really great stuff. Now, the way that group four is uh, delineated in terms of process and things like that, these GTL made from uh, natural gas are usually not allowed to be called group four. They basically PAOs are their own class. PAO is actually made from a gas. It's from a, they call it desine. So desine is a 10 carbon molecule that is then converted, polymerized into a larger oil molecule. What makes PAO, makes that group four synthetic. The GTL is taking a gas, they're taking natural gas, which is typically a three carbon 
molecule and then repolymerizing it and making a larger molecule from that. So it's, it's very similar, but it's just different enough that typically these GTLs are gonna be called a group three or group three plus. They don't fall in and fit that exact same category as a PAO, but that's fine. Their properties are very much PAO-like, so it's very much equivalent. Now, one interesting thing about that GTL process that does make it a little bit different than the PAO, which is why it's not a group four, because they're 100% saturated and so it basically means there's no double bonds. They have very low solvency. As a result, most PAO formulas actually contain a co-base stock. It will contain either an alkylated naphthalene or an ester or maybe some other group three or something else will be blended in with that PAO so that the additives can be dissolved, can be solubilized into the package. Because you gotta think about it, you know, an oil is two things. It's base oil and additives. And the oil has to be the carrier for the additives. But just like, you know, sugar in uh, cold tea, man, it doesn't really want to dissolve very well. That would not make for a good oil. You want the additives to dissolve completely in the oil. And PAOs don't do a great job at solubilizing additives by themselves. So we typically have a co-base stock to do that job of help with solubilization. Okay, why am I going on and ranting about that? Okay, here's the reason why. You can typically see that co-base stock in a PAO, especially when it's an ester in the oxidation value. It'll raise it up. A PAO ester blend is gonna be in that 30 to 40 range on the oxidation. And you're gonna see like an alkylated naphthalene is gonna probably hop where somewhere in the 10 to, to 20 range. What's interesting about this blend, GTL blend, is the oxidation value is coming in at 3.6. It's actually lower than the regular old Penn's oil, 5W30 conventional mineral oil. That is actually quite fascinating that the GTL is so pure it has an extremely low oxidation value, yet it's able to solubilize the additive package without a co-base stock. Pretty interesting stuff, you know, which is, it was one of the most fascinating things to see here. Now, I can tell you this, as we start looking at the additive package, some other things begin to come clearer. So, with this Dexos one, which has to pass some different tests, than the regular API SP package. And that severe test is the, the General Motors GMOD test, which is a 150 hour test at 150 degrees Celsius oil temperature, essentially 300 degrees. It's a really tough test. Uh, I, when I was previously working at Driven Racing Oil, we were doing some work with GM and Oak Ridge. We had to develop a 0W12 oil to pass that test. And that was like the scariest test we had to run. Well, how was it was gonna do during that? Was it gonna have a bunch of oil consumption? Was it gonna have problems? Actually ended up doing really great. Uh, it was kind of uh, surprising that an oil of that light could actually do that well. But a big part of it was having the correct base oil and the correct additive package that can handle that kind of extreme heat. So with that being said, now let's take a look at the additive package of that Penn's Oil Platinum Natural Gas yeah, GTL formulation. So the viscosity is right there at 9.9, .9, call it 10 cent soak, so dead middle of the 5W30 range. They probably did that to increase fuel economy a little bit. Uh, again, that's part of the GM deck, so I expect they have a little bit tighter requirement for fuel economy improvement. Again, oxidation value 3.6, super low. We know there's no co-base stock in that. And we get down to the silicon right there at 5 ppm. Now here's where it gets super interesting. Okay, that 150 hour, 150 degrees Celsius temperature test is probably about creating deposits. We wanna see that deposit control. You know, really long, really hot, very uh, intense test. 
yet this additive package only has 780 parts per million calcium. There's less detergent. So you got 780 on calcium, 321 on magnesium. There's less detergent in this oil than in this oil. Why? Because that GTL base stock is more thermally stable. It's cleaner, it's gonna produce less deposits, so they didn't need to put as many additives in it in order to get the job done. Hang on to that thought in the back of your head. Less additives since that they're cheaping out. Don't jump there yet. Don't go there. Hang on, hang on. Now, let's look at the phosphorus and the ZDP. So you're at 605 phosphorus, 763 on the ZDP. Well, it's a little bit different, probably maybe a slightly different type of ZDP here, maybe in this formulation because the ratios are a little bit different. Uh, but you know, we'll, we'll let, we will, we'll just assume that it's the same, but it may not be. Now we go down to the Molly. The Molly is only 60. Why did they reduce the Molly? Well, Molly is great. It's a synergist with the ZDP, but the more Molly you put in the oil, the more deposits it can form. Lower the detergent package, we've dropped the Molly a little bit in order to make sure we don't have too many deposits. And the next thing is there's no boron, which means there's no friction modifier from that side. But they may have also used a different type of dispersant chemistry in the oil. Some dispersants are called boron capped, and that could be sometimes when you see boron, doesn't always mean it's a friction modifier. It could be from a boron capped dispersant. In this case, they're not using a boron capped dispersant. They're not using any kind of boronated additives as a friction modifier which tells me this, they're really leaning on the base oil itself. They've used a minimal treat rate in order to make sure it's solubilized. That helps, less additives, it makes it easier solubilization. But they're really leaning on the characteristics of this base oil than the regular old APISP, which we know that APISP is a tougher spec to pass than the previous APISN or SM. It is a tougher spec, there's a better oil, but from what I see on paper here about these oils, it's interesting things. We can see that oxidation values telling us a lot about the differences in these formulations, which is why it's so good to have these VOA, these fresh oil samples to look at ahead of time to judge, you know, hey, what's in this stuff? What's the differences? And is this the right oil for me? You don't really know until you put it to the test but there's enough here that at least piqued my interest and my curiosity. I'm gonna give that uh, Pennzoil Platinum 5W30 Dex H1 a go in my old Porsche Boxster and see what she tells me. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.